Welcome back to Tech Leaders Talk, where experts and leaders in the wide world of IT discuss the industry and hard-earned career wisdom with your host, Barry Newkirk. Today's guest is Skip Lohmeyer. Skip is the Chief Information Officer at Parker Poe, Attorneys and Counselors at Law. He has more than two decades of executive experience with law firm technology, and he is passionate about sharing best practices with the next generation of tech leaders as they advance through their careers. He's also worked as an IT professional in the manufacturing industry, but an adjunct professor, and is a U.S. Army veteran. Skip holds MBA and BS degrees and several technical and industry certifications. He is a regular speaker and author on trends in the legal tech industry. He has served as the chair of tech conference committees and as a board member for the International Legal Technology Association. Outside work, Skip has volunteered for natural resource conservation groups and organizations serving U.S. military veterans. Let's dive into this conversation with Skip Lohmeyer. So Skip Lohmeyer, welcome to Tech Leaders Talk. Thank you for having me, Barry. I appreciate it. One of the things we want to do is kind of get a sense of your early life uh, as to how you kind of grew up, your family life, your upbringing, uh, where you went to school. So can you paint some of that picture for us to uh, give our listeners some insight into who Skip Lohmeyer is? I am the middle child of three kids. Uh, My parents uh, were married until I was 14. Uh, I grew up in uh, mostly Missouri, a little bit of Southern Illinois, but mostly Missouri. Uh, when people say, where are you from? They generally answer with, where, where did you go to high school? Mm-hmm. And most of my third grade through high school was in a tiny little town called Nevada, Missouri, spelled like Nevada, next to a town called El Dorado, uh, spelled like El Dorado. Uh, so it's uh, south of Kansas City, north of uh, Joplin, a lot of farmland, a very small rural community. So I grew up in a very small town and uh, there were really only three ways to get out of town. One was to get really great grades and get a scholarship and go to college, which my sister got all that gifted knowledge and experience. So she actually graduated Kansas University Law School with like third in her class or something. And she's an attorney in Chicago. And The other two ways were you could try to get one of the manufacturing or farm jobs in the area uh, or you join the military. So I joined the military at 17 years old. Um, I went to the Missouri National Guard and they had this program where uh, they let me go to basic training with regular army that summer between my junior and senior high school. So I look like a child in basic training. And I got made fun of a lot by the drill sergeants. And then you go back for your high school year, regular high school, and you do the one week in the month with your National Guard unit. And then you go back to your occupation specialty school as soon as you graduate high school. So a couple days after I uh, graduated high school, I went off to military police school uh, for the Army. And then I came back thinking I'll, I'll go to college. Uh, I'll do the one week in a month while I'm in the Missouri National Guard. But after a few months, I was like, this isn't um, what I thought it was going to be. I'd really hope for more. So I thought I'll just join regular army until I figure out what I'm going to do. So, and then the regular army, I got to do a lot of different things, uh, a lot of different jobs. I've had a couple of different occupation specialties in there and, and I really got a lot out of it. I really did. So I, I left Missouri behind um, when I turned 18 pretty much and uh, my mother still lives there. Uh, my brother still lives there. So uh, I go back and visit from time to time. What was your MOS in the in the Army? The military policeman was one. And then I also did ammunition specialist work. Um, and I got that MOS, but then I don't think I hardly did much of it. Um, I was the training NCO at one company. Uh, another one, I was just uh, helping with logistics for the, the company itself. Um, but I got to do some really cool stuff. Um, I went to desert storm and desert shield and there, uh, I just became a driver when you're a, uh, an enlisted private, you're pretty much, uh, tagged to whatever they tell you to. And I got this really cool job of driving this major around major Jim Anderson, which was ended up being one of my mentors, um, early in life. And, uh, he was like this green beret, special forces, ranger qualified gung-ho dude. So he took me everywhere he went uh, for several months. It was really an incredible 
experience. I got to learn a little more of the military from the top down instead of just being down in the trenches all the time. Wow. What a great experience that was. How long were you in, uh, in country, in theater? I think it was about nine months. So we got there pretty early. I was uh, immediately signed to the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment, which is now just the Cavalry Regiment. Um, mm -hmm. I took the armored piece away. But I ended up going to the 3rd ACR in Fort Bliss. I was there maybe a week and a half, and I went through this round robin of uh, processing to just get on a, a civilian aircraft and fly all the way to Saudi Arabia. We land, it was September, mid-September roughly that year. Uh, so it was still called Desert Shield mm -hmm. at that point. Right. Where there was, we need to build up forces to prevent Saddam Hussein's military from coming into Saudi Arabia. Uh, and then we were there until May. So I, I got to be one of the first groups to leave country. So I think that was in May that, that following year after everything had settled. Oh, wow. Wow. That is really interesting. I did not know that. I mean, I know you had military service. I was in Desert Storm as well, and um, and I was a driver as well uh, for a different All obviously right. uh, person. And um, my wife uh, loves to suggest to me how to drive on occasion <laughs> after thirty three years of marriage. And I'm like, honey, I got a combat driving patch and I have a combat patch. I got this. And, uh, yeah. doesn't go Probably over so well. Bad. Yeah. Doesn't go over so well. So, um, so you got out of that. Why'd you get out of the military? I originally got out, uh, of regular army and I still had a year and a half of my eight year commitment, um, to do in a national guard, unit. You know, so I picked the South Carolina national guard because I had a, an old family friend from Nevada that had, was the, uh, HR director at one of the local three implants in South Carolina. Oh. So I I went to visit him for a Thanksgiving. I said, I'm thinking about getting out and going to college, finish my degree. And uh, he said, well, I'll give you a room and board for 40 bucks a week. And I was like, there, that's it. That's what, <laughs> what I'm going to do. So that was in the mid nineties. Uh, I got out, I did the South Carolina National Guard. Funny thing is I actually got activated a few months later uh, in summer of 94 because the, there was a massive tornado that swept through Lexington, uh, right there near Columbia mm -hmm. and demolished like the whole downtown and a bunch of residential areas. So they called in the MP units to, uh, to cover 911 calls, uh, you know, guard the banks, uh, look after residents to make sure, you know, no looting happened. But I mean, it was so devastated that I remember the trees were like, um, toothpicks just laying everywhere. That's crazy. That's crazy. So you came to South Carolina after you got out of the military and you went to Southern Westland. Is that right? I first went to Greenville Tech. Okay. Uh, I did wait from Southern Wesleyan. Um, so one of the, the ways you can get out of the military a little early than your, your exit original termination date from regular army is is if you get accepted to school. So I, I could get an immediate acceptance to Greenville Tech. <laughs> so I ended up getting an associates from there. Uh, and then um, I took some classes also at Clemson, but my degree is actually from Southern Wesleyan University. And then I immediately enrolled into a, an MBA, bro, an MBA program at Webster University and graduated from there as well. So, And all that time I was thinking I was going to go back to the military and go to OCS. Right. And I got married and had a, a child and we just said, you know, that's, that's probably good. And, you know, for, for what I'm doing. And then I said, started, ended up doing this tech work and the money, you know, back then in the nineties, I and mean, it was the golden era of, of getting into computers. Right. So if you had any certification at all, and I picked up a, a Novell engineer certification in some of my schooling uh, at night and, um, and just, one, one job off, offer after another were coming in until I ended up in a little law firm. So I was going to ask you about that. So your bachelor's degree is in business and then your master's yeah. is uh, an MBA with an MIS emphasis. So when I was reading and doing my research for our conversation, I wanted to touch uh, for our listeners in particular, where did that 
switch? Where did you say, hey, I want to go into tech? How did that, had that always kind of been with you, Skip? Did something happen while you're in the military or in college? Can you help us understand that? Yeah, great question. I think I started tech, uh, touching technology really heavily when I was in the military. Mm -hmm. um, one particular company, we had this captain, Captain Ayers, uh, Leslie Ayers. She was a fabulous commander. And she brought in her own personal computer one time. This was early 90s. And said she had this program called Harvard Graphics, if you remember that. that I do. a long time ago. I do. And DBase4, a little database program. She said, I really want to figure out how we can track all the training that we're doing here for each soldier. Are they passing their PT tests? Uh, did they get their road march in? Did they, you know, do all these other tasks that you have to do throughout the year to to stay fit and um, qualified for your job? Mm -hmm. So, well, look, let me give it a wing, and she just let me play around with with it. So we created a database in DBase four, um, and that's how I ended up becoming the the training assistant there for the company, and. Um, and just tracking all the soldiers. And then we took that data and put it into graphs uh, in Harvard Graphics. Now, <laughs> Harvard Graphics is the like predecessor to PowerPoint, but at that point, you're still printing it on transparencies, which is pretty funny if you think about today. Wow. And so the commander would take these slides that, that are created and go to the big, you know, division or, or battalion level or brigade level briefs and say, here's where our company is. And she was the only one that had that level of visibility and it impressed a lot of people. So uh, that was probably the first like big win I remember with leveraging technology. Um, when I was in school, I did, uh, you know, odd jobs on the side because I was a married for part of that time and, and on my own. So I had to pay my own way. And, um, and some of those jobs leverage technology now always seem to be pushed into it. Um, and my wife's father, who was a retired green beret, uh, an officer from the military, mm. uh, was getting into tech as his second career after spending 20 some years in the military. So it was constantly at the dinner table talking about technology. And my wife ended up in technology, but she's a training IT trainer. Uh, and she also does a consulting for small businesses and in, in a lot in Greenville, South Carolina. And, um, and so it was, I just through just sitting there at the dinner table constantly had to be up on tech anyway. So I thought, well, I might as well make some money at my job doing this. So I ended up getting a help desk job at one of the, tech companies there in um, uh, the hardware companies there in near Greenville, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that just set the career trajectory from there. It sounds to me as if your proximity to that captain, because you were a driver and because you sharp guy and she said, Hey, can you help me with this? That's what was the gateway for you to get into tech is what, it, what I'm hearing. Does that sound right? Yeah, I think that was one of the milestones that, you know, when, when you think about stepping stones, mm -hmm. that was probably the brick number one they got in the, in the paving of the path. Right. And then others started falling. But I don't know that I realized that I'm going to end up in the tech field. Sure. Until I got that first real help desk dedicated IT job at that, at that tech company. Right. And then, then it was like, well, it's coming easy to me. I can learn this. I can help. I like listening to people and trying to solve their problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it just, uh, you know, networking, engineering, uh, architecture, project management, experiences started coming. And then it just built into right place at the right time mm -hmm. for a job yeah. offer to be an interim uh, IT manager at a small company. Right. And, that's amazing. Once you're, yeah. Once you're in those management tracks, and this is why I tell people that work for me, if you get offered an IT director or manager job, it's a major accelerator having that experience and having that title. I know a lot of people don't harp on titles, but the next job you're looking for, 
what's the first thing look they look for on your resume? The title. That's quite true. Let's uh, and let's transition into some of those career steps. So when you were here in Greenville, um, you were at Hainsworth uh, for quite some time. And yes. was that your first foray into the legal profession as a technologist? Yes. Okay. So um, I got that job as an interim. Uh, their IT director had left. Um, a consulting agency I kept doing uh, consulting gigs with called me up and said, hey, you want to uh, talk to these folks and see if you can't help them. They have a Novell environment and you have a Novell certification and uh, just to hold them down and, and keep the projects rolling. Mm -hmm. So I got in there and, and within three months of being there, they offered me the job. Now it was a small department, you know, PCs were not prevalent, I think in the, in the mid nineties in law firms. Um, so only about a third of the firm really even had a PC on their desktop, uh, on their, on their, uh, on their office desks. And we changed all that. And we built a plan in that three months and, uh, me and the one other it person there, um, created, you know, their whole leveraging of technology to enhance the practice of law. And the department grew from there, uh, to the point where, um, it was when we merged, we were, uh, merged up with a, another firm called Ogletree Deacons, which is a massive. Uh, international le uh, labor and employment law firm. Right, right. So, so your jump from Hainsworth to Ogletree was due to a merger. It was. Okay. How yeah, did that affect you uh, operationally, Skip, from a title standpoint? I mean, mergers are, yeah. a lot of people love mergers. A lot of people are scared to death of mergers. So um, can you walk us through kind of that transition? Sure. Uh, they were the bigger fish. Uh, so like any typical merger, they already had a, a CIO or IT director equivalent. Um, but the chief operations officer, who is kind of the, the head staff member, non-attorney uh, leader of the firm, um, and the IT director sat down and said, you know, we'd love to retain you. We hear good things about you. And I said, I, I'd love to stick around and help out as much as I can. Mm -hmm. um, I said, I, I'm going to miss being the department head uh, a bit. And they said, well, let's carve out the pieces that you want to, you want to manage. So they gave me all support, desktop management, the infrastructure, a um, lot of project management, uh, everything, but basically development and procurement, uh, I think reported to me. And then I reported to the, the IT director who was, very gracious and, and, um, uh, had a lot of experience and, and I thought we worked well together, um, uh, different styles. He mm -hmm. was also an army vet. Uh, so that, that worked out well for me. Um, and I stayed there seven years. It was, um, I m might not have stayed there if it had been, you know, a relatively stagnant, same size company, mm -hmm. but we grew from, I want to say it was something like 250 for, uh, attorneys or so. Uh, when we merged together, the, the total sum. When I left seven years later, it was over 600 attorneys. Wow. So the, the, the growth was breakneck. So it was exciting to, to be a part of the, the projects and the, the growth and see, you know, the operational changes from where you're a smaller company and you're more agile, but you don't have big budgets to do some really cool things to, big budgets, but you got to be very careful about how you spend your dollars. Um, you know, a lot more strategy and operational, um, uh, minutia to get things done, to make sure it's done right. Cause the, the impact is much larger if you don't, but you have the great big budgets to do some really cool, fantastic things. That's cool. Were you working with uh, Gary Berger at Ogletree then? Gary was my supervisor. Yep. Right. Yep. Gary's a cigar buddy of mine. I haven't seen Gary in a while, but, uh, uh, yeah. He, and he's been there forever. I think he's actually still there as a matter of fact. He is still there. Um, he and I are actually just this year working together again. 
uh, we're both volunteering for uh, the International Legal Technology Association's Legal Security Conference this mm. year. So we're helping put that together. After you left Ogletree, you went to Hunter McLean. I did. I wanted to get back into running my own ship again, running the department and really uh, connecting back into the business side to marry up what the business objectives uh, were with and then underpinning uh, technology to support and be a catalyst to enhance the practice of law for their business. So I ended up at Hunter McLean and I was uh, recruited there because they needed a total, a total overhaul in mm. IT strategy, as well as all the systems and software. So um, we did that in about 14 months. Okay. And how, just pretty- from a frame of reference, I'm assuming Hunter McLean is smaller a good bit than Ogletree. They were, they were considerably smaller, about uh, a tenth the size or so. So it was, it was a risk going to a much smaller environment, but uh, I felt it was important for me to get my hands back into the technology because at Ogletree, I was supervising direct or indirect, maybe 36 or more people Mm -hmm. and your hands get more and more off the technology, the more you're, you're supervising or directing or leading. And I wanted to get my hands back in the technology. I wanted to make sure I was the, the department head again, because I enjoyed the, the business side of it. Um, and then, so Hannah McLean came up and it, it was a great, transitional time for me to, to take that role, even though it was a lot smaller. Uh, so, but Mahana McLean, fabulous firm, by the way, incredible people just, and how can you deny living in Savannah, Georgia? You know, it's, it's fabulous there. It's, <laughs> it's great. It's a little warm in the summer, but uh, other than that, it's lovely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, we live in the South, so that's the way it works. I get the impression from hearing you, Skip, that you were not seeking a new role, that a new role, somebody recruited you to Hunter McLean. Is that right? Well, someone had told me about it and then I applied. Okay. Um, And then I started talking to them about, you know, my objectives and and how I could help them with with their objectives. So, okay. Worked out well. Um, I could have stayed there, but I got another really great call from a recruiter to say, hey, you should really apply for this this other larger law firm. And I did. Um, I hated leaving Hunter McLean because, I, I, like I said, they're a fabulous firm. I have never left any company that I didn't think was fabulous. Every company I've worked at it was just incredible, really gracious people everywhere I've been. That's amazing. I, I'm a big fan of the... Uh axiom you find what you're looking for and uh i think uh you know people who want to see good find good and then people who want to see bad find bad it it seems like one of your principles in talking about the different stops in your career that we've stepped through just far is being open to have a conversation and consider things that's what i hear yes you have to be willing to take risks and it doesn't hurt to just have a conversation Generally, if you have a job, which I always advise, don't leave a job until you have another job to go to. Right. Uh, But um, I really feel like if people were a little more risk taking uh, around their career, they might move a little faster. But Mm. um, I understand people's hesitation because it's it's how they put food on the table. But uh, just be willing to keep an eye out. uh, Keep relationships open with recruiter, you know, agencies and just the job market in general, it's important to just keep your fingers on the pulse of what's happening. Um, you know, why are people leaving certain jobs or mm-hmm. certain companies? Right. Just as a trend is important for you to make sure you avoid those <laughs> for yeah. yourself, for your own company that you're at. And then, um, and then just be willing to have a conversation periodically about, um, your career, options. Well, that openness, I think, is the important thing. What I see a lot in the candidates that we deal with, they overthink those things. And I'm like, just have a conversation. You never know. And so that openness, I think, is really important nowadays. Yeah, there's um, there's a lot to be said about those conversations because sometimes it 
it opened your mind up to possibilities you didn't think were possible for right. yourself. And for me, some of my reluctance to have those conversations uh, is because I don't want to disappoint the current company I'm at because I always have a certain sense of loyalty. Mm -hmm. um, but when I get to talk to the people that I always looked at as, you know, my boss, uh, bosses have always been mentors. Every boss I find mentorship in them. Um, the, um, those conversations when you say, I've got this offer and I really feel like I need to take it. And they'll all, you know, the good ones sometimes will try to talk you out of it. But, but then at the end, they're saying, you got to do what's best for you and your career. I mean, you know, at the time I've, I've made some of these changes, you know, I still had 30 years left in my career to work. So, um, they really were happy for me to, to get an opportunity of a lifetime for the next career move. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the move then from Jackson Kelly, where you were for two and a half years to your current position as CIO at Parker Poe. Jackson Kelly, another fabulous firm, and I, I could have stayed there a long time. West Virginia was a little tough because of all of our family uh, was far away. We were right in the middle of between St. Louis, where my mother lived, and then all of her, of my wife's family, which who we were very close with uh, and still are. And um, just a few years prior, uh, I had turned down a job um, to leave Greenville because my wife got a brain tumor and we had, and without family being present, I don't know how we would have made it through those months, uh, but she's great now, fully recovered. Um, and then, so we went to West Virginia, this was years after that, uh, being away from family was harder than we thought. Um, West Virginia is, is a beautiful state, by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, not a lot of new transients move there. So my son really had a, and we have just one child son, um, and he was in middle and high school when we were there and it was hard on him. And we thought, well, if we can get him closer to family, I think, you know, we'll, we'll get him through the rest of his high school years. And so we, we said, if, if a job opportunity comes up in the Carolinas, mm -hmm. take a look, and then eventually the Parker Poe job uh, came up on, on the radar. I talked to the recruiter um, who said, you really need to talk to these folks. Uh, they really want to be progressive with the leveraging of technology, which I found very exciting. And uh, so I talked to the board and then they had me talk to 53 people, I think, in the interview at, over like multiple days. Um, and then they offered me the job and I jumped at the chance of, of coming back to the Carolinas and, and uh, I'm home based here uh, at the primary office of Parker Poe here in Charlotte. I actually live in South Carolina. I live in Fort Mill. Uh, so I commute in uh, just 11 miles every day. And um, it's been a great ride. I, this is a, another fabulous firm and they've been another growing firm. So I think when I joined in 2015, they were about a hundred and 90 or so attorneys mm -hmm. were 275 now. Yeah. 270 attorneys. That's amazing. Tell us a, yeah. about your current uh, team. How on the, on the tech side, how many folks do you oversee? Kind of give us some frame of reference or context. Sure. So uh, there are 17 positions here in the IT department. I also look after the library says research department which now I've moved to an outsourced entity rather than having it in-house. Our, our uh, librarian of 36 years uh, retired this year. And we, so I said that the modernization of library, you know, really needs to look at outsourcing this as a piece because the library is no longer a place for a law firm. It's not the right. massive room with books everywhere on shelves. There's hardly any bookshelves anymore. Right. It's an online resource. Um, the IT department is made up of four teams, uh, the largest, uh, and front and center team to the customers are lawyers, uh, paralegals, secretaries, and so forth is the support team. So that's your help desk slash desk side support, mm -hmm. uh, folks. So they do, um, wear multiple hats there. There's no help desk level one, two, three, and, and that kind of thing at this size company. 
we're all doing the same work at the, in that team. They're, they're deploying machines, they're upgrading machines, they're supporting machines, they're helping people with video conferencing events. Uh, so whatever comes our way that has to touch technology, they're troubleshooting and, and implementing it. Second team I've got is uh, I have two IT trainers. Um, one of the things that is a critical strategy in any law firm I've been at is um, building and optimizing the knowledge worker mm. by fusing them with uh, experiences and training uh, to properly leverage all these technology investments. So we have two IT trainers. That's all they do is they train people how to get the best out of our technology investments. Mm. Um, third group is the applications group. These are like the, the subject matter experts for specific applications, the bread and butter ones, like our document management system, which is a critical uh, app at a, any law firm I've been at uh, in, a, in our industry. Uh, we create uh, legal advice and it all goes down on a document somewhere. Well, we have millions and millions of these documents out there. That's not even to get into the evidence documents that you get from a client associated with a case, that might be something, uh, a different pile. But um, so docket management is critical. Uh, our financial system is critical for the time and billing and tracking and all that and mm -hmm. keeping track of all of our matters. You have to do things like conflict checks before you can bring in a matter or client. So there's a lot of uh, tech components that support those processes. Uh, the legal life cycle. Right, uh, for, of a, for a matter with a client. Uh, so they do all that. They also do the desktop or desktop image, um, the computer image uh, mm -hmm. building and maintaining. Mm -hmm. And the last group is the infrastructure slash the security team. This is four guys that uh, their whole role is to take care of all the trains on the back end to make sure they're reaching their destination. Switches, routers, servers, wide area network, uh, disaster recovery, business continuity components and services, uh, cloud provider security, you know, just lots of different things that they do. So we wear a lot of hats in each of those groups. Uh, but a few things that I like to point out about our team is that, um, and I tell this to every person in our department, we're all one team and we are a customer service oriented department. So we are all help desk and that is our role. No stone goes unturned and no job is outside of our realm. Uh, if the company says we need help moving this table, we're going to help move the table. I mean, while they pay us to be experts in technology, we do what needs to be done to make sure this firm is successful in providing extraordinary legal services for our clients, period. Um, and there are three success factors. Uh, and I go over this with interviews and, uh, you know, candidates that are wanting to come here. There are three things that make people successful in a law firm and probably any kind of company. And I call it the IOU system. And the first one is integrity. If, if you don't have a high sense of integrity, you're just not going to make it in a law firm, especially because you're dealing with professionally trained, uh, Bull crap sniffers. I mean, they, will, the, if you try to baloney an attorney, they will see through it immediately. So you can't give a snowy answer to, to an attorney. Um, so your integrity has to be really, uh, beyond reproach. Hmm. The second thing is ownership. So whatever comes our way, that's the stone goes, you know, always go, gets turned over. Um, the illustration I like to use is, um, you know, you, you've got good ownership and you got great ownership. The good ownership or customer service is you're at a restaurant and you're eating with your, your family and the waiter or waitress comes up and says, how was your meal? And everybody just says, fine. Mm -hmm. But if you take it to the great level of ownership, that waiter or waitress would walk up and just fill your drinks make sure you have what you need, anticipated, you know, specific things that they picked up on when you're ordering or came in. Like, uh, you know, I see you're running out of mango chutney for your sea bass and I brought you a little more, you know, because you, you mentioned that. So uh, it's those little things that really matter in providing extraordinary 
uh, customer service. And that's the ownership part. Mm. Then the last one is a high sense of urgency. Uh, everyone matters. Uh, so you have to be able to triage quickly. Um, and your urgency has to be equal or greater than the person calling you for help. Sometimes when people come into a law firm, they feel like everything is like on fire last minute sometimes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it can feel like that. But for the most part, that's how legal work is sometimes done. So we have to be ready and anticipate the urgency that's necessary to get the job done. I owe you. I love that. How does your how do you find internally in your team and your 17 folks? Is this something you've had to help them come along and see the vision for that skip? Or when you got there and when you hired in these people, they connected to that immediately? Is that an education training activity or, hey, these guys got it? I think it's both. I think you have to look for people that have an aptitude and potential to reach that extraordinary level of customer service. Mm -hmm. um, but then the rest, you just coach them and provide to them what they need to be their best. So my role isn't to tell them what to do. My role is to make sure they have the skills and the knowledge and the resources to be their best. I mean, if I can draw out the best in somebody, that's what makes me motivated to come back to work the next day. Because if you can see people succeed, it's exhilarating, right? Yeah, you, absolutely. You know, it's, there's something intangible in that, that, uh, that just motivates me anyway. Let, let me drop back to a couple of things you said. Um, you said, uh, major Anderson was a, was a mentor for you early on. You also yeah. mentioned that every boss has been kind of a mentor for you because what I'm trying to get to is for you to tell a story so that that listener can connect and go, Hey, I didn't realize that that person is, or has been a mentor for me. Maybe I can go back and I didn't really connect the dots. For me, my experience with mentors has been, I didn't sometimes know they were a mentor until sometime later. Right. Uh, I always thought younger, when I was younger, you go out and ask, Hey, can you be my mentor, my coach? And the experience as I've had are the opposite. They just happen to be people that are around that you can observe, ask questions to, or just um, sit back and and see how they interact with others. Uh, that's the observation part, I think, that's critical. Just what do they do that's successful? What, what have they done that wasn't successful? Uh, what can you learn from their successes and failures? Um, you know, there's a uh, few other folks, probably uh, Wanda Rice. She was the firm administrator, Hainsworth Baldwin. Um, she was very much a, the, one of the most respectful leaders I've ever seen of, of personnel. In fact, a lot of the what I model is how you respect everybody at any level and provide them with the dig dignity they deserve comes from Wanda Rice. She was just fabulous, probably the best I've ever seen in HR related capacity. Um, you know, Gary Berger, you know, watching how he analyzes things really impacted how I break down a problem. Uh, sometimes you, you just got to keep asking why or how it works until you get down to a level that you can make a, a better decision. Mm hmm. I learned from uh, another boss that uh, there's no better time to abandon a project than the moment you realize it's not going to give you the results that you had hoped. <laughs> uh, my father-in-law, uh, who's now passed away, the, the Green Beret, uh, Wayne Garrett, uh, retired Army Special Forces guy, um, the style of guy that walked into the room and took command of the room and he wouldn't even have to say a word that kind of, right. But a few things I, I learned from him were, you know, always press forward. No decision, uh, is a bad, is the only bad decision. No, making no decision, being paralyzed. Uh, the analysis paralysis is what I've heard other people call it. Right. Right. That's a bad thing. Uh, having a plan is critical, but 
life or your plan never works out like you thought. So be ready to shift directions. That's one thing I learned from him. Um, he told me that the day that uh, I asked uh, for his daughter's hand in marriage from him. <laughs> Let me ask you, I'm, you know, since I identify with your uh, army uh, service, um, you're a young guy right out of high school driving yep. for a major. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. Like you were, yeah, talk, you uh -huh. were talked about throughout the battalion in front of you and behind your back. I have no doubt about it because I've been in those day rooms and those barracks. So I have to believe, Skip, that Major Anderson either blossomed some stuff in you or planted some stuff in you through that interaction that probably still carry with you. Would, it, would that be a fair assumption on my part? Yeah, I still keep in contact with him because he was like a, a, a mentor, a leader, a boss, and to some degree, you know, in a combat zone, he was kind of a father figure too. Absolutely. And, um, you know, a few things I learned from him that, uh, that probably, you know, still resonate uh, strongly are mission first, results matter. And it's not just any results, it's results that matter mm -hmm. um, yeah. above all else. And then everything else can come after it. Um, you know, he just, he was um, an incredible guy. Um, and uh, we talk every year uh, still. Um, we share our war stories together, the things that we got to do together. And because as a driver, as you know, I mean, you spend a lot of time with the person you're, you're working with. Absolutely. Yeah, that's awesome. That's such a cool thing. Let me uh, uh, switch to a last uh, subject area. Um, you know, I call this the view from here. So you're uh, CIO, Parker Poe, uh, nationally recognized, very successful law firm. You've had an amazing career thus far. Um, what are your areas of focus going forward? And what are some of your goals going forward? So for the next at least 15 years, I hope to continue uh, providing that IT leadership that a company needs to help marry and use technology as a catalyst to enhance their business. And if that's a Parker Poe, I think that's going to be awesome. It's an incredible firm. Um, after that, I might, uh, I've thought long and hard about uh, teaching. Um, and I did get to teach some undergraduate courses at Southern Wesleyan uh, after my MBA was completed. And that was really rewarding. I got a lot out of that. And, and as an introvert who generally does not like getting up in front of people, it was a great experience um, building confidence in speaking. And that propelled me to be interested in more things like um, volunteering at uh, the International Legal Technology Association, where I uh, did the conference co-chair work. Uh, I was on the board of directors for a time. And that was really incredible. Um, writing articles for their publication and speaking at their events. So it, uh, things like that, you got to look for, you got to stretch yourself a bit, even if you're a little uh, uncomfortable with it, that it's their career accelerators. Hmm. Well, it goes back to what we talked about a few minutes ago, being open. What are some of your goals going forward, um, at Parker Poe or throughout the rest of your career? So at Parker Poe, our strategies uh, for the next three years are focused on optimizing the technology investments that we have invested in this year and have planned for next year. A lot of it around uh, effic efficiency gaining solutions and services, um, leveraging new innovative uh, services or technologies. I'll give you an example of that would be we have a, a contract due diligence automation tool that yet leverages artificial intelligence and it learns about all the contracts you load into it. Mm -hmm. or let's say it's all lease, you load in a thousand lease agreements uh, for a client and you say, you know, a law changed. So any of the leases that have a particular um, provision in it probably needs to be addressed. So the thing is, when you talk about a thousand lease agreements, they might have been written by 
you know, dozens of different law firms that have been vetted by the opposing side uh, lawyers. And it's a lot like artwork uh, contracts and agreements uh, from the lawyers. So each one does it a little bit different depending on what state or country you're talking about. The, f- the phrases might be very different or the terminology and words that they use might be different. So you can give those thousand contracts to a room full of associate attorneys and say, find us the things that, that are in here and they'll spend many hours doing it. And you know, it racks up a pretty good bill for the client, or we can feed it into the system to get a jump on anything that even remotely looks like what might be that phrase or, or provision that we're looking for. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it will learn, um, as more people use it, which is really cool. And then it spits out the report. Now you can have a smaller group of associates reviewing more select areas of the agreements that you have that, that might need the provision changed. Okay. And the accuracy has gotten to a point. It's really, uh, excellent, excellent yeah, as a good starting point for, for a law firm to use. And clients love us using it for two reasons. One is, uh, it's faster sure. and we don't have to bill as much for it. So it's really a huge advantage. And this kind of thing is going on now. Um, you know, there, there was an original rumor in the legal industry that, you know, well, it's going to be robot lawyers taking over the lawyer's jobs. And, right. And I think that, that's actually further from the truth. It's allowing lawyers to go deeper and really help their clients be even more successful. Yeah. So these are like, like I say, these, these tools are catalysts or accelerators to get things done better. So that's our focus over the next few years. Hmm. I use the, uh, the military phrase, uh, with customers and with candidates all the time. This is a force multiplier. Yeah. And people connect with that. And, and you can see the ones who have some connection sampling touch to the military world and some who don't. And then I have to explain it. And of course I use a whiteboard like is behind you. Cause you know, I grew up in tech, so we got to have a whiteboard skip and yes. I go, Hey, you got a platoon of eight. And if you do this, this, and this, you can have a, a you know, the effectiveness of, of 12 or 16 or 18 people. And they go, you see the light bulb go on. So, um, those kind of, and, and it's amazing the technology that is out there now. Uh, when we started our business 20 years ago, half of this stuff did not exist. And it's it's wild how much stuff that can really be done for large and small companies. So um, I, uh, I credit you guys with that. I did a little bit of research, and I know you're a family man. You're a proud veteran. Um, I got the impression you're a beach guy. And uh, I think you work at you do some stuff with national park service. True. Uh, so I have volunteer for national parks. I'm not right now, but that, that was very rewarding. Uh, when my son was in boy scouts, I loved, uh, going out with the boy scouts. So I volunteered as a assistant scout master, uh, and den leader for a while. Sure. So that was a few years. That was fabulous. So, I, you know, it made me really appreciate that we've got to take care of our parks and our, our, you know, our outdoor areas and recreation. So conservation is a big, important factor for me. Um, and while um, I like the beach, I like going to the beach because of the family. Uh, I Ever since Desert Storm, I hate the sand. I, just, I, don't know. <laughs> I hate it. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> my, uh, my wife and I moved. We're empty nesters. And we moved about right at about five years ago. And I still have my desert storm boots and they still have sand in them wow. people do not believe me and i and i say, well I'll, I'll show them to you you know i didn't get this from uh, charleston or myrtle beach or folly or anywhere this this is uh this is middle east sand you know and it's a it gets everywhere um that's a we need to leave that there tell me uh your volunteer for national park service i uh our family has had this kick over uh, the last three or four years skip of going to various national parks what's your favorite national park uh the new river gorge is pretty cool and uh that's in west virginia yeah and 
And that's where I did the bulk of my volunteering. Really fabulous river, um, you know, the heights of the mountains. And then um, they have this uh, event every year called Bridge Day, which is over the New River Gorge. It's, it's the span they built there. And it's one of the tallest spans like east of the Mississippi. Mm. And in Bridge Day, which I think is like the third Saturday of October each year. And they let people come from all over and leap off this bridge and parachute down. And uh, we went there and watched that one year. It was exhilarating. I wouldn't do it, but there are <laughs> hundreds that did all day long. They're just taking turns jumping off the bridge. That's amazing. That's amazing. I, uh, <clears throat> I would do that. My wife would be freaked out because she does not do heights very well. My, uh, my favorite national park that I've been to so far is uh, definitely Zion uh, out in Utah. Uh, we went out there last summer, and uh, it was incredible, incredible out there. Well, my son has been wanting to go to that one for some time. Oh, well, you, if, if, if you or he go, uh, let me know, and I, I got the perfect setup for you. I got the perfect place to stay and uh, we got it wired. We did uh, my daughter and son-in-law and I hiked Angel's Landing, which is the big uh, hike in yeah. Zion. Super scary. Um, makes uh, being in the military in a combat zone look like nothing from my experience. <laughs> and uh, we did uh, uh, the narrow. So we can talk about Zion one time if you want to do that. Let me ask yeah. you, um, it's very clear to me that – you are very focused, a very focused individual, um, but you're also very interested in giving back. You talked about your work with the Boy Scouts and National Park Service. I know you uh, support a lot of veteran things. Tell me about where does that mentality, that attitude, that desire to give back come from for you, Skip? Well, I think it comes from my, so we're talking about now my faith. So my faith, uh, I am a Christian and I mean, who are we, but to give back? I mean, what are we, our legacy isn't the greatest tech that we implemented or, you know, how tight we were with the budget. It's our legacy is living on through the people around us, uh, and the lives that they touch. Mm -hmm. So back to, you know, helping people be as successful as they can be, that's, that's where you want it to be. That's to me where your legacy lies is making sure that the next generation or generations uh, have the knowledge and the skill to make the world a better place. Looking back in your career and in your life, do you think you've always had that view or did um, something change uh, at some point where you went from a different viewpoint of life to this viewpoint of life, or has it always been there? It's been there since I was in my teens. Uh, albeit, uh, I think like most boys, I go through the selfish phase between like 18 and 20, where you're just, you know, you're just trying to figure out life itself. But, um, uh, yeah. It, and really the influences of the people around me, you know, mm. uh, you know the people that we've named already, um, you know, my son influences me now with watching what he's doing. So he joined um, Infantry Airborne right out of high school. Wow. And he's he's been with the 82nd for five years now, and he just re-enlisted for another five. And and um, he's uh, he really uh, has taught me that you can't look back at your mistakes with regret that you only look back at those to learn something to be better for the next time around. Like everything that he says that could be a regret, he just leverages to be better moving forward. Mm. Uh, he's, he's a really cool dude. How old is he? He's 23. Just a few quick questions as we end that we uh, kind of ask everybody, uh, Skip, so you'll indulge us in our, uh, in our lightning round. Um, okay. when you are a younger professional <clears throat> in your career, building out your career, putting those building blocks or those bricks in place, like we talked about, what did you overvalue then that is not as important today? Oh goodness. Overvalue. Um, 
probably that you have to be an extrovert uh, to get things done. Mm. Um, and really early, so this is in the military, and you, you, I'm sure, have experienced this, Barry, is that you're thrust into leadership roles at a super young age. Absolutely. 18, 19, 20-year-olds. I mean, a captain leading uh, you know, 200 soldiers into combat is what, maybe 24, 25 years old at times. Right. I mean, it's insane how young these leaders are. Uh, the army gives you the tools and the training to help you hone that leadership and, and, and abilities. Mm -hmm. Um, but the first time you're ever a leader, right. You think you have to be this hard nosed dictator. Right. And what you learn very quickly is, um, that doesn't work very well <laughs> and your peers call you out on it every chance they get that's right so you have to learn um how to be and how not to be and having that experience um at a young age really helped hone my leadership skills early on i think it just set the foundation early i didn't have to break the foundation and start over on the flip side of that coin, what did you undervalue when you were a young person that is incredibly valuable to you now? Uh, family time, uh, saving more of your paycheck for a uh, rainy day. Um, I discovered uh, this guy named, um, and you probably heard of him, Dave Ramsey, yeah. uh, of his books um, in the early 2000s. And boy, I had wish I had read some books like that earlier on. Mm. Uh, Me too really about taking care of your personal finance is critical and the pressure release in your life from being debt free is remarkable it is i mean it is that's a life-changing personal change is being debt free oh yeah and what's your favorite word skip i should probably ask my son what he hears me talk about more than anything <laughs> else probably integrity um you know you make mistakes and if you do and it offends somebody, you need to go to that person and talk to them. Um, you know, that's just having integrity at work, at home, at church, wherever, wherever you are, it needs to be consistent. You know, it needs to be who you are. I think that's, that's probably what my son would say is the word I say the most to him. Integrity matters. Don't compromise your integrity. If you, if you, tinge even a little bit of your integrity, fix it, figure out how to make it better. What's your least favorite word? No, just no. One thing that, uh, here at this firm, they told me that how I'm different from the, my predecessors here is that I hardly ever say no mm. it's because I don't like to tell people no. I like to see if we can't figure out how to get you what you need to be successful without saying no, no, we can't do that because of security parameters. No, we can't do that because we don't have the budget. Those are the two no's I think previous folks have said too much. The answer is, well, we have limitations, but let me see what we can come up with for options. By the way, people love options, right? They like to have good, better, best options. Absolutely. They really do. If you don't, they, and it also gives them the power to decide their own fate a little bit. Mm. So people, like I said, people love options. That's awesome. What profession other than CIO would you love to try? Professional bass angler. See, I was right about the fishing thing. I was right about that. Yes. <laughs> I love fishing. So I'm actually, uh, the last three years I've been involved with the Queen City Kayak Bass, bass Fishing Club. And uh, it's a it's a bunch of people, men and women who love bass fishing and uh, maybe they can't afford a bass boat or maybe, you know, a bass boat is such a hassle. And now with gas, I mean, it's insane to own one, but it's all kayaks. Yeah. And uh, so every month we have a tournament on a Saturday and we compete against each other. And, and now the club is up to like a hundred to 150 people every Saturday that, that competes now. It's, That's awesome. it's fun. It's, it's a lot of fun. Last question. What profession would you not like to try? Sales. Um, I know every one of us in, in part of our jobs do some kind of salesy kind of chats or, or, you know, when you're trying to 
convince people to, you know, go in a certain direction or adopt a project. Mm -hmm. Uh, But as far as a full-time job, sales, not me. It does not sound fun to me. Skip Lohmeyer, thank you for being on Tech Leaders Talk. We so appreciate your insight and your willingness to share and be transparent with us. And, And I know it's going to be of high value to our listeners. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Barry. I really appreciate it. This was fun. Thanks for joining us today on the Tech Leaders Talk podcast. Learn more about our show at techleaderstalkpodcast.com and follow us on social media. We are Tech Leaders Talk Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And we're on Twitter at Tech Leaders Pod. Subscribe to our show wherever you get podcasts. And please share this episode with at least one person in your life who would benefit. Until next time, Tech Leaders, keep talking.